Just so thankful for the body of Christ here at Forest View, and um, I have a little bit of uh, a lung issue still going on, so we'll see how well that works out for today, and um, just getting some strength back. So, But God is good, and we, we trust Him. I know all of you, too, you've been through so much. The winter's been long on us, and a lot of, a lot of illness, and uh, but God is ever faithful, and we, we trust Him, and uh, learn learn from these experiences too uh, one one verse one verse from the 23rd psalm you know you, you embrace it and you think about things when you're when you're dealing and um, he makes us to lie down and sometimes he knows when it's time to do that it doesn't go along with our plans but it goes with his plans so God is in perfect control he's sovereign and we and we trust him uh, let's bow for a word of prayer as we begin our service and ask his blessing uh, today on our time together. <clears throat> Father, we, we bow before you this morning to give you thanks and praise. You're a good, good Father. And God, you teach us much uh, through the things we, we go through in life. And uh, we never walk alone. We thank you that you're ever faithful. Thank you that you have sustained so many, Lord, over these last few years, and God, you're uh, proving to us that uh, you're on the throne, and uh, you never leave us or forsake us. And God bless the body of Christ here, just so thankful for each one. Uh, God, they mean so much. Uh, may we bear one another's burdens, and may we uh, fulfill that, that law, Lord, uh, that law of love in, in your word. Uh, blessing our, our congregation today, our time together. We pray, God, that you would encourage each one, minister to the needs that are represented here. So many unspoken requests. Uh, we just continue to pray. Uh, we pray for uh, Pastor John Williams, Lord, former pastor here, uh, who was faithful over the years, battling with cancer. And uh, God, uh, just uh, give him your supply and meet his needs. We, we thank you for his faithfulness. Uh, Lord, again, bless each family here and what each is, is dealing with. And Father, we look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. And it's in Christ's precious name we pray and ask. Amen. Where sin cannot hold 
morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Praise the Lord. Uh, it's good to be in the house of God. Amen. And uh, what a precious song that is uh, near to the heart of God. And uh, I hope that's your prayer this morning, that your desire is to be near his heart. Amen. Because I know that's where my heart is. And, uh, you know, I, I want to share a little thought with you today as a kind of a discipline in prayer. And, um, the Lord puts on my heart, and I hope it, I can articulate it uh, as, as I feel it in my spirit. But, um, you know, the Bible says in Revelation that God stands at the door and knocks. And he says that if any man hears his voice, he will come in, and he will sup with him or make his abode with him. And a lot of times we think of that scripture as... Um, as something that a, a sinner prays and he accepts the Lord into his heart. But I've heard on a number of occasions that actually that scripture is referencing, referencing to the Christian. It's an invitation to the Christian. And as I thought about that, I thought about our hearts. And I, 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 I think about the many uh, facets of our being. And the Lord wants access to every part of our hearts. And you know, when I think about our hearts, I think about a house. And uh, so fitting the song, because the Lord just doesn't want to just come into the front door of our hearts and, you know, and we invite them into the parlor or the living room. But he wants to be invited into every room. Every room. And when you think about that, you know, we may have a group of people and we may invite them into our living room and, uh, and it's great, you know, and we have fellowship. We do have fellowship, right? But then there's maybe a private room. Maybe there's a private room like a family room that's, you know, it's, it's for you and your family, you know, and it's more private. Uh, a bedroom is more private than a living room. And, you know, you think about these areas of privacy and those areas, those areas that we tend to kind of withhold from God, he, he, he is asking that we would invite him in because we need him in those areas. Amen? And so when you, th when you think about prayer and when you go to prayer, you know, you know, just envision your heart as a, as a place where there's many living spaces and, and, and begin to just invite the Lord into those areas of our heart. Amen? And just say, Lord, I, I invite you into this place. You want access into that area? I invite you into that area. And, and it's just a beautiful place to just invite God and to have intimacy with him. Amen? So let's just invite the Lord into our service today, into our lives afresh and anew, and uh, just, just invite his presence here. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that, God, you are a good, good Father. You are a good God. You are holy. You are just. You are righteous. Your way is perfect, God. Father, we are a needy people. We are, Lord, needy, O oh God. Every minute of every day, God, we need to depend upon you, Lord. Lord, for our very breath, O oh God, is dependent upon you, God. And Lord, we invite you here this morning. We invite you in this place. We invite you into our hearts. We invite you into all the aspects of our lives, O oh God. Father, we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord, as you, Father, not as you love us, but Lord, we want to know you more in that, in that way, Father. 
Help us, Lord, to, Father, just to love you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our spirits, with all our being, God, with all our strength. Help us to know you, God. Help us, Lord, to be intimate with you, Father. Father, we ask you for this day. Lord, this is a new day. Father, a, a new day to, Lord, understand you even a little bit better, God. And so we invite your presence here to, Lord, to, uh, in, uh, Father, just to open up our hearts and open up our understanding. Father, to be uh, available and to be ready to receive what you have for us this day. Father, I pray for every heart that is gathered here today, Lord. God, you know us all. You know us very well. You know every need, oh God, that we've drug into this place. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak specifically, expressively to that need, God. I pray, the Lord, that, Father, that we would not leave this place until we have felt in our hearts and in our spirits that we have met with you. Father, I pray for our pastor today, God, as he brings forth the word. I pray, God, that you would speak to his heart and speak through his lips. God, that we would also, Lord, have hearts to hear and ears to hear what you would speak to the church, Lord, your people. Father, we thank you for this day, for this is a new day. Father, we will rejoice in it. We will be glad, O oh God, for the things that you have provided, for the things that you have in store for us. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You're welcome to stand if you're so inclined. <laughs> if you need the rest, by all means, you, know, you stay down. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> But whosoever here is shout a shout the sound Is glad the blessed tidings all the world around You tell the joyful news wherever man is now And whosoever will may come But whosoever will, whosoever will You send the proclamation over vale and hill Tis a loving father calls the one for all And whosoever will may
be seated. Thank you, Doug and Karen and Linda, leading us to his throne this morning. Just, just before the message, Sherry's coming to minister to you in song. the sum of every high and every low. Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know.
Thank you, Sherry. What a wonderful God we serve. Uh, I guess just by way of uh, praise report as well, last night we had the uh, 514 uh, concert here at the church and wonderful turnout. Uh, we had uh, older gentlemen <clears throat> come, to know, come to know the Lord as a Savior last evening, so it was a real blessing. <clears throat> and you know, that, it, it kind of got me thinking a little bit, and um, on a day that I shouldn't be doing a lot of talking, I got a couple extra things I want to share with you, so how's that work, you know? Put a suit on him, set him up in a corner, and he looks okay, so we'll, we'll try to make it through. But um, anyway, it, it kind of got me thinking a little bit, you know, on any given Sunday, any given, given gathering, you know, that we, <laughs> we have for whatever reason, you know, we, we really don't know what people have been through, we don't know who's among us, and you know, um, the body of Christ is a special group of people that need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You know, we may never see the person again that, that darkens our door, and we have a window of time, you know, to, to um, maybe engage someone or be led of the Spirit to say something, and um, you know, the fellow that was here last night, you know, we might not ever see him again, or or on a Sunday morning, you know, what you've been through this past week, you know, what, your, what has your week been like? And I think, I think through the pandemic and through what we have experienced, you know, the body of Christ needs to be in fellowship. The body of Christ needs to be connected. We need to bear one another's burdens. Uh, we need to uh, really, really know where those struggles are and the victories that are experienced and uh, engage in those. You know, it's good to hear what brothers and sisters in Christ are, are, are faced with and what they're going through. And um, uh, without, without that connectedness, and it's hard to put it into words, but without all of that, uh, we, we truly can function as God designed it. Um, <clears throat> my nephew's here from, from Virginia, and his brother Josiah um, made a post about a week ago. I don't know. Um, where it originated or whatever, but it kind of resonated with me in regard to what I'm sharing with you. I'd like to, I'd like to read this to you this morning, and it's entitled, uh, Church is Hard. A church is hard for the person walking through the doors, afraid of judgment. Church is hard for the pastor's family, sometimes under a microscope of the entire body. Church is hard for the prodigal soul returning home, broken and battered by the world. Church is hard for the girl who looks like she has it all together but truly doesn't. Church is hard for the couple who fought the entire way to church. Been there, done that, huh? Church is hard for the single mom surrounded by the couples holding hands and seemingly perfect families. Church is hard for the widow and the widower who have no invitation to lunch after the service. Church is hard for the deacon with an estranged child. Church is hard for the person singing worship songs overwhelmed by the weight of the lyric. Church is hard for the man insecure in his role as a leader. Church is hard for the wife who longs to be led by a righteous man. Church is hard for the nursery worker, the worker, we shouldn't use the word worker. Church is hard for the nursery volunteer who desperately longs for a baby to love. Church is hard for the single woman and the single man praying that God brings them a mate. Church is hired for the teenage girl wearing a scarlet letter, ashamed of her mistakes. Church is hired for the sinner. Church is hired for me. It's hard because on the outside it all looks shiny and it all looks perfect. 
Sunday best in behavior and dress. However, <clears throat> underneath those layers, you find a body of imperfect people, carnal souls and selfish motives. But here's the beauty of the church. Church isn't a building. Church isn't a mentality or an expectation. Church is a body. Church is a group of sinners saved by grace, living in fellowship as saints. Church is a body of believers bound as brothers and sisters by the eternal love of God. Church is a holy ground where sinners stand as equals before the throne of grace. Church is a refuge for broken hearts and a training ground for mighty warriors. Church is the converging of confrontation and invitation where sin is confronted and hearts are invited to be restored. Church is a lesson in faith and trust. Church is a bearer of burdens and a giver of hope. Church is a family, a family coming together, setting aside differences. I don't know why I'm emotional, I just, just am these days. Church is a family, a family coming together, setting aside differences, forgetting past mistakes, rejoicing in the smallest victories. Church is a body, and the circle of sinners turned saints is where he resides, and if we ask, he is faithful to attend. So even on the hard days at church, the days when I am at odds with a friend, when I have fought with my spouse because we're late once again, when I've walked in bearing burdens heavier than my heart can handle, yet masking the pain with a smile on my face, when I've worn a scarlet letter under the microscope, and when I've longed for a baby to hold, or fought back the tears because of the lyrics that were sung, when I've walked back in afraid and broken after walking away, I'm always reminded he has never failed to meet me there. Hey, we need to be the church. We need to be the church. We need to be God's people. And you know, Satan has taken enough from us. He's robbed us enough in these last days. And uh, the church needs to stand up and fight. We need to stand up for truth. And we need to know that God's going to honor those uh, obediences. Eric and I were talking a little bit before church this morning. You know, there's something about perseverance. There's something about staying close to the stuff. That what you know in your heart you believe, even, even when your emotions aren't connected, the facts are you know, that Christ died for us and he has assembled us as, as, as his family to be about his business. And um, if we're not together, we're not the church. You know, and that's, what, that's what's really mind-boggling. You know, we who have been uh, in the church for a long time serving and and uh, worshiping him, you know, to, uh, to, to take that component away is, is something that we ought to miss. It's something that ought to just not settle right in our spirit. And, um, you know, we need to examine that. The body of Christ needs one another. We're to bear one another's burdens. We're to be here for each other. We're to uh, engage in a lot of what was just read there, you know. And um, the potential that God can do through his, his people and his spirit is something that is immeasurable and uh, we should never settle for, for anything less. And so church is hard, but you know when you do church right and you do it God's way, church can be messy because after all, you know, we don't want to we don't want to dirty ourselves with somebody else's mess or problems, and we don't want our our uh, our, our doctrine to be a little bit uh, skewed. You know, when we got to engage in ways that uh, kind of causes us to be touched by what other people are going through. And again, we need we need to love like Jesus. We need to uh, exhibit that love, and we need to uh, show that. And so, when the young lady comes in with a bearing that scarlet letter or somebody feels they're under the microscope or they're they're under judgment you know this is a spiritual hospital 
where people experience spiritual healing and uh, restoration and to be restored. Let us never be people who kick people to the curb. Let us be people that embrace people no matter where they've been and what they've gone through. And so that, that was one thing that was on my heart. And um, I just saw my nephew post that. Might have been his wife, Megan, but uh, nonetheless, it was posted and uh, wanted to read that to you. Um, <clears throat> but before we, look, before we look at the message this morning, I just want to tell you where we're headed and what we're doing and where we're going. And uh, with all that said, I have no idea. You know, <laughs> we, make, we, make, we make our plans, you know, but God, God completely has things orchestrated and we just need to yield to him. And uh, sometimes, you know, you get thrown a curve. Sometimes he makes you lie down. Sometimes uh, he, he changes the direction. And the question is that needs to be answered, uh, are, we, are we open to the Spirit's leading? Are we going to follow him or is it my way? You know, it's got to be God's way. This is God's church. It's God's family. We're privileged to be a part of it. And we need to engage in, in all of these things. But anyway, um, <clears throat> over the course of uh, the last few weeks, um, in, in, in some studying, and I felt, I felt, I felt um, early on there during whatever it was, I, I, I kind of felt, you know, oh, this is going to be a great time to study, you know, great time to get into God's Word, and you know, I just, I just, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't study, I just couldn't concentrate, you know, so it's kind of like, oh well, you know, there must be other things planned here. So anyway, but with that said, <coughs> in just the last little while, um, I, I just want to give you some direction on where, where we're going to be headed. So looking at doing a, a series starting next Sunday um, in, entitled basically Freedom, Th Freedom Through Forgiveness. And for some reason, you know, God laid that on my heart and uh, it's kind of resonated a little bit. And um, I, I, I think there are a lot of paralyzed Christians. I think there's a lot of lack of growth in our own lives because of things that haven't been dealt with uh, in our lives properly. And, you know, if we don't get this issue of forgiveness down properly with a, with a godly understanding, it is, it is just that. We're not going to grow beyond that point in the Lord. You know, some of you in life, the longer you live, you know, uh, you've been on the receiving end of deep hurt, or you have been uh, the one who administered the hurt, and so we've all been on both sides of that situation. But a couple of questions for you this morning. Uh, what, what, does it, what does it truly mean to you? What does it truly mean to you to be forgiven of God? You know, we talk about that all the time, don't we? You know, Jesus bore our sin. He forgave us at the cross. Um, and you know the theology, and I'm not going to get into all that this morning. But, you know, there is a great need of true and right understanding because that statement is so very foundational for you to be able to forgive yourself and also to forgive others. And, you know, you say, well, I, I know what the forgiveness of God is all about. Well, how does that translate in your life? What does that look like? What have you experienced because of, of God's saving grace and God's grace alone? But understanding what true forgiveness really means. You know, you, you can kind of probably put, put some statements to that and put it together and make, make an oral presentation over it. But, you know, I, I, I think foundationally, if we don't get this right, the, the, the struggle is, is there, struggling um, to forgive ourselves, you know, and, and forgiving others. Uh, and I want to share with you that the depth of this topic is so foundational and so important. You will never grow in Christ Jesus beyond the point of the lack of forgiveness. You will not grow in your faith. That is huge. That is, that is devastating to think about. And the, and the problem with that is, it's not that you don't want to grow. It's not that you may, you may not want to forgive. 
but uh, understanding God's true forgiveness in your life and what that really means and how that's defined biblically, uh, we, we, we want to look at that a little bit uh, deeper so that that foundation is, is really set um, in your spirit. Forgiving others, someone who's hurt you deeply. Um, by the way, to forgive someone is not to let them off the hook. To forgive someone is to turn them over to a righteous God so you can get out of self-imprisonment. And a lot of us have built walls around ourselves, you know, and we might even come out with statements such as, um, I was hurt so deeply, I will never allow a person to ever hurt me that way again. Poses a different question, though. How are you going to how are you going to prevent that? See, you have everything to do with how you respond to things, but we have very little control over the, over the way people might engage us. So what are we going to do with this? How do we work through it? How do we have victory? How do I forgive people? You know, God has called us to do some pretty, um, pretty tough things in life when you think about it, and that's where I want to go with this message this morning. But, you know, when you think about it it, 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 it goes against my human nature, you know, many of the things that the Bible teaches us to do and to be faithful in and to be consistent about. And so, how do, how do, we, how do we get there? How do we experience uh, living on, uh, on that victory side to experience the things and the result that God intends? Well, you know, God never calls us to do anything that he doesn't provide for. The struggle in all of these things is we look at uh, issues from a human perspective. But you've been created new in Christ. You have a new nature. You cannot live the Christian life, and I know Eric spoke to this, and uh, you cannot live the Christian life outside of God's supply. But sometimes how we deal with it, we see it from a very human perspective because after all, we're very human. This thing called forgiveness all the other many things we're to engage in uh, biblically, you know, really, God has called us to a task that uh, we cannot measure up to. We just can't. We just can't do it. Thus, there are many defeated Christians. Many people walking around not experiencing abundant life, not experiencing victory in Jesus. It's because we're trying to live the Christian life which is completely divine in its origin, and we're trying to live it in the arm of the flesh. You just can't get it done there. So, what does it result in? Well, defeat after defeat after defeat. Instead of pursuing the things of God, we need to learn what it means to prefer the things of God. Prefer to do it His way, under His design, with His, his development with our, in, our, in our lives, spiritually. And so, forgiving others, it's not about letting this person who's hurt you deeply um, off the hook. It's about getting you out of that self-created prison that we, we have, we've developed for ourselves. And again, my greatest fear is the greatest hindrance to um, spiritual growth is that unforgiving spirit. And I believe it's, I believe it's true. You are not going to grow beyond the point in your spiritual walk until you deal with the things that have kept you paralyzed and the pursuit and energy and effort by wanting to make sure that somebody else is fairly dealt with or justly dealt with. Well, you know, that's above my pay, my, my pay scale. I know a righteous judge who sits on the throne who keeps a perfect record, and we can trust him. Not that God is going to uh, hit somebody with a bolt of lightning, but when you truly understand what it means to be forgiven of God, that translates uh, hugely in how we go about dealing with other people. And I, and I could surmise this morning, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of us here, including myself, there are things that have happened in our lives at some juncture in, in our lives where we have masked over it. We have, allowed it heal. we have allowed it to heal improperly. Some of us walk around with a limp. 
Some of us have scars. Some of us have many things because of what we've endured. Life is not fair. Life stinks at times. It's very unjust. It's a fallen world. But you know, Jesus breaks the cycle. And, and the church needs to be the church. You have a young girl that comes in wearing the scarlet letter. We need to love on that girl. Not stand in judgment of that girl. We need, we need to be God's church, living God's way, set by his example. This is his church. It's not our church. It's his church. We've been entrusted with it. You know? And so... <clears throat> I could just rattle on with, it, with this stuff this morning, but that's where we're going, as far as I know. Now, I might be out the next three Sundays. I, I have no idea. So, Eric, you better be ready. David, oh, I know you're going away for a little bit, but uh, you deserve the break, too. So, anyway, that's what's on my heart today, and um, wanted to share that with you a little bit. But as I was saying, what time is it? Quarter to 12? Is it? Quarter to 12? That means not a thing. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's right. Who's keeping time? There's nobody in the Super Bowl today that we're even interested in, right? I mean, it's like, really? Once the Bills, once that happened to the Bills, you know, it's like, it was, the season was over. So whatever. But you know, I, I shared with you a few minutes ago in conjunction where I'm rattling on here, and I hope you can connect the dots, you know, kind of thing. And uh, oh, Uncle Evan, Megan, Megan sent out a little thing this morning too. She's doing her biology class, you know, kind of thing. And the Hudson she said, oh, he's trying to study biology too, and he's, he's got this line running through all of her notes. Kind of thing. And I said, well, he's just, he's just connecting all the facts, and he's learning, you know. And she said, I hope so, you know. And so, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it boils down to trying to connect these dots that I've shared with you this morning in some way, and I hope you get it because I'm not going to repeat myself because I have no idea what I said. But uh, anyway, God has called us to do some pretty out-of-the-way kind of things, you know, you think, about, you think about praying, praying without ceasing, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you, having a legitimate, consistent prayer life where you're seeking after the mind of God and the heart of God, not always the hand of God. You know, and he, he's called us to that engagement, if you would, in communication. And a lot of Christians run around defeated because if you're honest about it, every one of us would stand up and say, well, my prayer life isn't what it ought to be. Well, why is that? And then, and then you get into the issues of repentance. You know, being, being able to say that I'm wrong. Being able to say that uh, I screwed up. Being able to say that uh, I, need, I need to come to the throne of grace with this you know, in repentance. You know, pride is one thing that will really hold you back. It rears its ugly head, and it'll hold you back from admitting that, 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 that you're wrong, maybe in a situation. And sometimes it never dawns on us that we couldn't be possibly the one who's wrong on this issue. You know? So God calls us to, to some pretty tough things, you know? And, and what about the issue of thanksgiving? Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Is that how, how it works? You know, I'm not always a thankful person. Just like I read, you know, what my, my nephew and them posted. You know, I, by, by, nature, by nature, I'm a selfish person. You are too. That's why sometimes church is hard, because we want our way. It, the point of the matter is we need to begin to understand we need to get out of the way. And let God have his way in our hearts and in his church to do some miraculous things that we have not even seen or experienced. 
You know, we, we just need to let go. We just need to let God. After all, He's altogether wise and He knows all things. He knows better than we do. You know, who was God's counselor? You know, where were you when He hung the stars and put the planets in orbit? Where were we? And we're giving God instruction as if we have something new to say that he's never heard before. But, you know, I was thinking about this when I was putting this message together whenever I put it together. I don't really recall. But um, there's still a few cobwebs going on. But, can, but, but the whole thing is, and I know I think Eric preached on this and talked about this, too, it's... Um, not only has God called us to do these specific things, and the Bible teaches us to be engaged in these given things as Christian life and conduct unfolds in, in, in Christian behavior, but you know, without humbling ourselves in the presence of our mighty God, these things are impossible. But what is impossible to man is, is possible with God. And, and God has called us to live this life in a way that others might see Christ in us, who is the hope of glory. But I struggle with these things. My prayer life, and, and sorry to disappoint you, pastor, struggle. My, my, my prayer life often is anemic. You know? And uh, am I always thanking God? If I deliberately think about it, I'll give him thanks for, for things or, or thanks for what he's done or how he's intervened and how he's worked. And that's what we truly want. That's what we truly desire. Do I, have always, do I always have a repentive attitude and spirit? I don't. So, Lord, you've called me to some things that are a pretty tall order here, you know, and in a, in a, in a tough task. And in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, <clears throat> It says, you, young, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another. You know, oh, it's okay to be humble in the sight of the Lord, but I take issue about humbling myself for you. And the fact of the matter is, that is how we take the precepts of God, the teachings of God, and the Word of God, and that is how it is then lived out in the presence of one another. When the world sees us, do they say, oh, oh how, they, oh, how they love one another. There's something special there. There's something unique there. And one, and one, thing, one thing I did mull over the, these last few weeks, I am very thankful for this church. I'm, you know, I might be a little bit uh, slanted on that, you know. I know we're an imperfect people. But, you know, in a lot of respects, you get it done and you do it God's way. And, uh, and I'm thankful for that. But, you know, these things just aren't unto the Lord. If you've done one of these things unto the least of one of these brother, one of these, of the least of these brethren, brethren you have done it unto me. And so... In that passage of Scripture, it says, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another before you engage in conversation with each other, you know, before you, uh, you, you, you take issue about something. You know, we need to look at the moat in our own eyes before we see something in, in somebody else's life. It's easier to point the finger, you know, of uh, drawing attention away from your problems and pointing out everybody else's. And so clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And you know, I, I just want to touch on a couple of these things with you this morning, and I know, I know time is running late, and I hope the other things were um, something important for you to receive as well. But uh, I'll get to this one here this morning on how prayer relates to humility. And I think the question in and of itself is, is, is answered by looking at the nature of prayer to begin with. Consider it with me this morning, if you would. Looking at the very nature of prayer asks or answers the question of how prayer relates to humility. So when I'm expressing my heart to God, 
sincerely seeking his wisdom, depending on him. Lord, without you, I can do nothing. Lord, you're, you are all wise. You are all knowing. You know what's best for me. It's not like coming into a pastor's study and already having a, a, a foregone conclusion about how all of that conversation should go to convince somebody to, to take your position or take your side. Lord, I yield to you because of who you are. You know me. You created me. You gave me the breath of life. You are the one who has sustained me. You're the one who orders my path. You've ordained it. And God, I'm looking to you. I'm asking you. So how does, how does humility relate to prayer? Well, in true prayer, the true expression of our hearts, it is a complete dependence on God. It acknowledges a few things. John chapter 15 and, and verse number, number 5 you might have memorized that verse before. What did Jesus say? He said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. And if you abide in me, and I abide in you, that means you do life with me, you walk around in this, in this um, measured area of, of, of God's teaching, of God's blessing, of God's understanding. If you abide in me, and I abide in you, you shall bear fruit. Fruit that is much and fruit that will remain. But outside of this dynamic of depending on me, getting your strength from me, getting your nutrients from me, the branch standing alone outside of the vine, here it is. You can do nothing. And so it embraces and it acknowledges God's Word, prayer, the question of how this humility relates to it by the very nature of prayer itself. And I didn't write down the words to the, to, to the um, song, the old, the old hymn of the faith, and it's entitled, We Need Thee Every Hour. You know the song. And we truly do. But sometimes we come to the throne of grace and we're trying to give God everything that we know about the situation. And after all, God is going to uh, see and be compassionate and, 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 and kind of come over to our side after we try to embrace Him with all the convincing that we can possibly do so He sees it our way. No, what God sees is the motive of your heart. And what God sees is that we are either yielding to him and coming to him, and that honors him, by the way. You read his word, that honors God. You spend time before his presence and communing with him, that honors God. He desires that. But when we come postured as a counselor to God and telling God that we want it to work this way, then God would probably simply in turn say, well, why did you come in the first place? If you had it all figured out and you have all the answers and you know how it ought to go, oh, by the way, God will let you go down that path too. And then after a while, God can ask us the question, how's that working for you? You know, but you know, God has your best interest in mind. And God has a design. And God has it worked out. And I believe in my heart that, you know, we, we have missed out on, on so much of what God wants to show to us and what God wants to reveal and what God wants to do through us. And that issue of forgiveness, it just keeps resonating with me. It needs to be dealt with in the life of believers. And if we truly do not understand what it means to be forgiven by God, truly, what does that mean? Biblically, we're going to look at that. We cannot go beyond that with the wrong understanding in dealing with our own need of self-forgiveness and forgiving other people. We can't grow in faith. We might, you know, the Bible says, if, if you come to church to offer your gifts at the altar and there remember that you have ought with a brother, something between you and someone else, what does the Bible instruct? It says, don't go on 
with this deception of unacceptable worship. If there's something between you and a brother, you just come in like everything else is, everything is fine. We read that church is hard. Everything looks shiny. It looks polished. Everything looks good in behavior on a Sunday morning. Oh, but you should have just seen me this morning. You know, kind of thing, if you were a fly on the wall in somebody else's home or that fight in the car. But the Bible says if you come to the altar offering gifts to God and there realizing that there's something between you and another child of God, maybe another, another individual, something that is not right, leave your gift at the altar, go deal with that if you haven't put that at the cross, and when you have done things God's way, then you come back and offer pure and acceptable and un- unadulterated worship to God. You see, that's how seriously God takes it. It isn't just like my life is going to hell in a handbasket and, and uh, things are falling apart, but I come in and wear, bearing that smile and everything looks right and we look like we have it, we have it put together. But the person sitting next to you in the pew, or, or if not you yourself, we're sitting here sometimes and we're just falling apart. And this act of worship becomes ritual. It becomes religion. It becomes dotting the I and crossing the T, and we got it done. Now we can get back to the misery of life. But you know, prayer is related to humility. When I bow my my knee to the Lord and I worship him because of who he is, and it flows from a heart that is surrendered a heart that is yielded. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. But Lord, you've called us to some pretty daunting things here. And often we're very defeated because we do not pray as we ought. We're not always giving Him a heart of thanksgiving. We don't always because of pride, being willing to to repent of what God might put His finger on and reveal to us because we're not doing it as new creatures in Christ. We're trying to analyze it and put human effort to it. You see, it's not about trying harder. It's about putting up the surrender flag, the white flag of surrender. So, Lord, I'm tired of trying to live this thing I'm tired of trying to do this thing my way. But, oh, Lord, I, 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 I feel defeated. There's nothing on the face of the earth more miserable than a person who is out of the will of God and trying to do things that God has called us to do in the arm of the flesh. It just, it just can't be accomplished. Therefore, how many Christians are defeated? How many, how many, how many believers have never experienced, you know, what it means to to know the victory that is truly ours in Christ Jesus. And that's where I want to bring you to in some some weeks coming up. We need to get a true understanding of what real forgiveness is in our lives foundationally so that we can move beyond that point. And then also an acknowledgement and prayer of a complete dependency is, is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 5. Not that we in and of ourselves are adequate to say that or to think that anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from the Lord. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. All glory, laud, and honor unto our Lord. It's nothing that we can put claim on. As soon as we touch that which is holy, it it no longer is. It becomes distorted in in so many different ways. Prayer related to humility. It's the acknowledgement that enables us to say that that God is merciful, that God is mighty, that God is all-wise, and that God is all-knowing. He's altogether good. I think we were talking about it this morning a little bit. Said, you know, it's God isn't up in heaven trying to figure out a way to to make you happy. You know, it's not about it's not about being happy. That's 
that's circumstantial. You know, we're, we're happy because of an event. We're happy. You know, God wants us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And he wants us to do that with joy and fulfillment. And we're serving a merciful God, a loving God, a, a God of great comfort. And, and, and that's truly, God wants us to walk with obedient lives to his word and just dare to trust him, believe him, and prove that he is who he says that he is. That person you might be struggling to ever have forgiven and that stopped right there 15 years ago or what have you. The most devastating thought around that is that's when your Christian growth stopped. That is devastating. But your hurt doesn't go unnoticed to God. He knows what it means to be hurt. He knows what it means to be paralyzed in, in an abusive relationship. Or, and I'm not making light of any of that. Oh, we just flippantly forgive people. You know? But there is something that God has miraculously done in your life and my life. And when we truly get it, foundationally, and the light bulb goes on, we're going to deal. We're going to deal. We're going to open those scars up again and let it heal right Hey, wouldn't you love to get rid of that spiritual limp, finally? I don't want to drag my butt through the finish line one day. I want to run across the finish line. I want to be found. I want to be found faithful. I want to be found faithful to the end. I want you one day to have to carry me out with my boots on, preaching God's word, but more importantly, getting it right in my life so I can live the message. My prayer life isn't consistent. I'm not always one with a thankful heart. I'm not always one who is willing to admit readily that, that I'm at fault because we deal with that sinful, prideful nature. And then we try to live the Christian divine life out of the same well. Well, how can a well bring forth fresh water and salt water all the same? It, it's, it's an impossibility. How can a fruit tree, if I walked down the street and I saw a pear tree growing over in Bish's yard down there, and I saw strawberries hanging in that thing, I would be weirded out. It just, is, it just isn't, it doesn't work that way. How it works is when people look at us, the world looking in, they see us, the branches connected to the vine, and doing things that just don't add up because it cannot be produced by the physical man. He is bearing fruit. I used to know that guy in high school, you know, kind of thing. Chick, you know, we've been down that road. What has happened in that person's life? You see somebody 30 years later, they're in love with Jesus. You were the one who was robbing our, our teacher, smoking the joint behind the, behind the welding curtain rod. I went to trot, by the way. I went to trot for ministry, you know, kind of thing. I remember those guys. And then you, then you meet up with them years later. And they're singing the praises of Jesus. They're going to church. They had a Christian and godly family. What happened? Well, what happened is God was merciful and God reached down and saved them. And then for us to live out these things that God has called us to live out that are humanly impossible, we need to see that as very true. It was impossible for you to come unto God on your own. He reached down and saved your miserable soul. And if he didn't throw out the lifeline, you would have never been rescued. And that's because he loves you, and that's because he cares for you, and he died for you. And we need to be about God's business. I can't have the prayer life that I've always desired to have if I do not have a humble heart to acknowledge who God is. And we can talk about this all afternoon, and I praise God he has given me voice today. <laughs> Our God is a good God. Let's pray. Father, we 
experience these things, just not knowledge for knowledge's sake, it's experiential knowledge. Father, your truth and knowing your truth can set us free. And this truth around the subject of forgiveness, oh God, so many of your children need to know that truth so that they can be set free to serve you with gladness, to serve you without burden, to serve you, Lord, with not being consumed by, by things that rob the joy in the heart of the believer. Oh God, help us to be consumed with you, to desire your presence, to abide in you, to walk around in you, that we might bear fruit, fruit that will remain, but without you we can do nothing. Our adequacy is not in of ourselves, not that we have any claim on that, but our sufficiency and adequacy is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Oh God, dismiss us with your blessing today with eyes and hearts and minds that would be willing to examine our lives. Oh God, we need to be tired of being robbed of your blessing. We need to be tired of being robbed of your supply. But the biggest thief is ourselves. Oh God, set us free that we might serve you. Set us free of those things that so easily entangle us. Weights of this world that, that uh, just just uh, bear us down. Help us to be overwhelmed by your love and consumed by your mercy. God, we love you. Church is hard at times. But God, may we make it a little less difficult for people who are yet to be received by you. May they be received by your church. May we not be judgmental. Father, may we live lives that show forth the love of Christ because we've experienced it. Go with us that we might be a blessing. We are so blessed, Lord, and in turn, there's no reason why we shouldn't be the same. We love you, encourage our hearts. May we be willing to have teachable spirits to tackle this topic it might be painful, it might be difficult. Oh, but God, to know your truth is freedom, and we truly want to be free. We love you and praise you, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you. Have a good afternoon.